Uh, please join me virtually in welcoming Catherine Rye Jewel. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Make sure everybody can hear me and I, as I enunciate about college radio. All right. So hopefully that is sharing so that you can all see the party, the party ball. Uh, since I am starting in the 1970s, appropriately, uh, maybe we'll go backwards a little bit. Uh, things setting up here. So we're going to start in 1978, perhaps unsurprisingly, as rumors of a call letter change percolated through these volumes, or one volume, of the book. This is a hardbound ledger kept in the WTBS studio at MIT in the basement of the Walker Memorial Building, where handwritten notes uh, about station announcements, technical problems, conversations regarding station affairs, all appear. By WTBS's annual benefit in 1979, warnings surfaced not to mention Ted Turner on the air, but that the call letters might transition to WMBR before that event, and thus two forms of promotional announcements would be recorded for that upcoming event. MIT Station had turned down the New York Times' 1973 petition for the letters, but Turner's offer came at just the right time. Although the station had increased power as the FCC was phasing out the Class D license popular at most college stations on the FM non-commercial band, it needed another upgrade to prevent challenges for its license from higher powered stations, thus, thus straining its budget. Donations had also flagged and the station received scant support from MIT given its independent license held by a nonprofit corporation, although it remained a student activity, which is why uh, station positions such as general manager um, are required to be students. As one alum remembered, out of the blue, Turner contacted the station to buy the call letters. Of course, he remembered buying call le letters was not legal, but after negotiations, it was agreed that Mr. Turner would donate $25,000 to the radio station when it released its call letters by acquiring new ones. And then he donated an additional $25,000 once WTBS became his. Instead of WTBS standing for the technology broadcasting system, the new letters, WMBR, would stand for Walker Memorial Basement Radio. That is the check in the book, in the studio, where it still resides, or maybe a book, I don't know. As the deal went forward, Turner insisted that the station refrain from using the call letters he has paid for to avoid association between a college station and his Atlanta-based broadcasting empire. The general manager cautioned announcers not to inform listeners, even those calling in, of the whole Turner story. Even though Turner's $50,000 classified as a gift, not as illegal payments for call letters, it, it didn't seem wise uh, to dwell on the transaction. Finally, the telegram announcing the change arrived. Carter Allen wrote, that's it. WTBS has been nuked and no longer exists. Instead, WMBR arose from the ashes. The official change took place at, on May 24th, 1979 at 0300, the hour all FCC license changes take effect. Staffers turned back to questions regarding programming, staffing, and making Cambridge rock. Turner's check appeared in WMBR's coffers at a moment when changes were gripping college radio, commercial broadcasting, and higher education. There's just a few listed here. Forgive all of the text. I got a little carried away. There's the Pacifica decision, though. There's changes to the Class D license. There's weakening public service requirements for commercial broadcasters, such as they had been, as well as regulatory changes that would embolden urban renewal efforts and the corporatization of higher education. College radio garnered attention from administrators, political officials, and the music industry for reasons beyond questions of obscenity or indecency or political balance in broadcasting subjects that often receive the lion's share of attention to culture war era battles over media and entertainment. Given these developments, on the surface, 
Turner's purchase of WTBS's call letters seemed to signal the coming deregulation and corporatization in media. For media scholars, Turner's empire signaled consolidation and convergence in, that would transform entertainment and in the 1980s and the 1990s, thanks to faith in the concept of synergy to choke out competition, thanks to revised antitrust enforcement and rule changes regarding ownership and licensing. So college and community radio in this rendering seem like these stalwart underdog defenders of democratic radio and diverse voices against the stultifying middle road entertainment on offer from corporate media and the record industry, which was intent on cramming disco and arena rock, or as Bruce Shulman lamented in his history of the 1970s, the Peter Framptonization of the music industry. But college radio, existed as part of the larger economy of radio, as well as within and in relationship to the commercial music industry, to broadcast media, to regulation, and to these institutions of higher education. So what I suggest is that instead of seeing these signals as simply authentic democratic alternatives to these developments, instead it needs to be understood as a site of negotiation regarding these developments in US media, political economy, and popular and political culture. Now, perhaps this revised narrative doesn't exonerate Peter Frampton for his contributions to popular culture, but they do put the history of stations like WMBR into new perspective. So WMBR, while it stands out among college radio stations for its independence from its host institution, nonetheless can't fully escape MIT's institutional logics, nor the ever-present challenges to college radio's democratic potential and contributions to American musical culture. So to explore this dynamic, since I'm at MIT talking about WMBR, I'm going to take a little bit of an uncommon approach for myself. Rather than kind of traveling over the country, I'm going to use WMBR as a lens and give you three episodes in its history with a little epilogue uh, to explore these confrontations uh, with these larger historical source uh, forces. So turning to episode one, we're going to go back before the Turner check for a little bit. When WMBR then, still WTBS, signaled how from the early days of campus FM stations, students connected campus activism to community service, revealing how institutions of higher education were embedded within communities. So we're starting in Boston, where soul music fans turned to college stations after 1969. A Boston Globe columnist described, quote, the aridity of the AM airwaves insofar as consistent soul programming is concerned. He encouraged readers to escape the assault of insipid broadcasting by tuning in to student-run radio. Boston University, Harvard, Boston College, Emerson and Tufts all offered a range of black oriented programs. Harvard consistently programmed jazz since the 1950s while Emerson offered the black experience. Northeastern aired a show called Soul's Place dedicated specifically to that genre. But the columnist singled out one show, The Ghetto at, at MIT for its quality. In 1969, MIT's Black Student Union, its chapter on campus, had sought an outlet on the campus radio station, the student activity, reflecting civil rights activism's turn to cultural celebration and Black power. In addition to a Memphis Sound program and a throwback R&B show on weekends, MIT's station kept listeners sustained with music unavailable on commercial radio. And there's a great write-up of this program here on this website that I have linked here. So you can go and kind of read, read the full history that I'm kind of pulling from here. So WTBS had eight watts when the ghetto debuted, but that increased to 720 by 1972, helped along by an MIT trustee and FCC member who smoothed the process. Even with this still limited coverage, the signal reached into densely populated areas. As the first engineer for the ghetto, W. Ahmed Sali pictured, I think it's, yeah, it's a picture, this picture. Um, as he remembered, 
The number of shows and nightly programming meant MIT station became the number one black radio station in the entire Boston metropolitan area. I don't know if this will play or not. I don't know if it will, it will, it will with the zoom, but you can go on, on to, and uh, there we go. You can hear from a, on YouTube. For the most of night band jazz, rhythm and blues. Check out the ghetto with 88.1 FM, Sunday through Thursday. 88.1 FM, Sunday through Thursday. After midnight. Hey, y'all check it out. 88.1 FM. It's called the ghetto. I don't know how that sounded, but <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, so. The ghetto sets MWTBS apart in the entire Boston metropolitan area for its programming. So MIT's offerings amounted to more than alternative musical entertainment. These shows together collectively helped in uniting the black community, the former DJ explained. The ghetto and the BSU offered local, national and international news, Student DJs designed programs to emulate higher powered black oriented FM stations in other markets, hoping to diversify the sound of the hub's airwaves. As Sally remembered, we became like the number one station in Boston. I mean, black, white, everything. WTBS featured artists uh, to promote local appearances, uh, pop entertainers such as the Jackson Five, jazz artists such as Al Jarreau visited WTBS to record promos and give live interviews. Sully remembered visits by Aretha Franklin, Richard Pryor, Isaac Hayes, and Stevie Wonder, because as he put it, if you had any event that was going on in Boston that was black, then you had to get it on the ghetto because everyone would hear it. In 1972, the ghetto hosted a concert by war that attracted more than 20,000 fans. That event inspired ghetto DJs to imagine my single favorite instance in college radio history, a city party. But the hub at WMBR or WTBS, excuse me. The ghetto essentially would broadcast music to a party hosted outside the station. Then there would be satellite parties at other area college stations that rebroadcast what the MIT signal was putting out on their low watt signal. Together, these 10 watt signals would blanket the entire region essentially um, across greater Boston. As Sally described, everybody in their homes and cars were urged to turn on the ghetto and to play it loud. You could stand outside almost anywhere in the Boston metro area and hear the party. People were dancing in the streets. There's another newspaper article that describes driving down streets in Boston. You could hear parties in living rooms out on the streets as people were tuning in all across the area. The event, importantly, netted more than $10,000 in donations for the station. The ghetto's hosts, moreover, became leaders of the station. Unlike other institutions where students found campus stations often to be closed to black students and student leaders, MIT proved different. A DJ for the ghetto became WTBS's general manager in 1971. Sally became the station's first licensed engineer along as serv with serving as comptroller. MIT station offered significant time to programs for the area's black residents with music and news tailored to their interests. Eventually commercial FM stations in the market emerged to displace MIT's status as Boston's leader in black music, but it remained an important spot on the dial for soul, R&B and reggae featuring both student and community DJs. Institutional arrangements proved crucial to this outreach. MIT's governance structure allowed WTBS the freedom to pursue community-oriented programming. Although the station received institutional support with its on-campus space and qualified as a student activity, it enjoyed greater independence from, than other college stations. Nonetheless, despite existing in an ecosystem somewhat apart from commercial radio or even from host institutions, non-commercial licensed stations still worked within the broader structure of broadcasting and the commercial music industry. Therefore, I turn to episode two. So in episode two, uh, we're moving on from City Party, which indicated how college radio could offer community service and culture in defiance of commercial broadcasting trends. 
Still, these links were strong with commercial interests. College radio was becoming known as in the music industry as a place to test new sounds. Signals support for new wave and post-punk after 1978 in particular show that these signals could make waves in popular music. But only a handful of independent labels existed with most college stations still relying on major labels or major label distribution for the music they played. Along with the FCC, labels privileged higher wattage signals in major markets that could reach many listeners on a single frequency, providing an existential threat to small underfinanced stations that were facing budget cuts thanks to declining enrollments and state funding. So these college stations, they could drive sales in certain genres and demographics in certain markets. Arista Records, for example, for one, enjoyed a very good relationship with college stations as its jazz records, including those by Gil Scott Heron, received play on many college signals. But those good relations gave way to dismay among college DJs in 1979 as major labels began cutting back on college promotions inflation, economic recession in the late 70s hit the music industry and labels cut this promotional staff. Billboard reported in August 1979 that college radio is entering a crucial stage with many stations in jeopardy of being cut off from free record company service. A&M Records, which for 10 years staffed a dedicated college radio promotion team abruptly axed that wing. RCA, MCA, Electra Asylum, all cut staff who focus on promoting to the college crowd. As album oriented radio, the commercial format left behind its free form days, these are stations like WBCN in Boston, the industry, the radio industry and the music industry welcomed the data driven approach of these new commercial formats that made financial sense in hard times. Labels could ill afford to send records to college stations where they would gather dust on shelves during the summer, for example. So it was labels financial woes that accounted for the decision, not any sort of perceived shift in college radios, it was too weird or too out there or something like that. Executives focused on stations that proved they could make waves in the market. To receive free records, stations had to show that they could break new artists, that they could drive sales at record stores and provide that data back to the labels. So stations amateurism often fragment and it's, it's fragmented schedules in these block programs, which you'll, you'll see some images of that, that worried these promoters who were increasingly cognizant of their bottom lines. So by summer of 1980, and uh, if you can see, this is just the beginning uh, of, of what's about to happen. Um, by summer of 1980, WMBRs realized that their record service was in jeopardy. One DJ attention called, uh, called them the record manure people. He spelled it this way in the book. Uh, I felt I had to spell this out for you. Uh, and he, he pointed to distributors who cut off the air supply to non-com FMs. He suggested DJs contact those disc heads on high. The book is amazing for direct quotes. I like can't stop quoting. Um, it's, it's, like, it's like ridiculous. Um, Contact those disc heads on high with the campus perspective. DJs debated, you know, they're just a small watt station. They're one of many. Uh, so they're, they're thinking about how to combine their power with other stations to protest these changes. Arista Records was the one that's gonna emerge as the prime target regarding its record service fee, but that it wasn't the only one that WMBR DJs targeted for boycotts. And they were sort of a subset uh, within this larger Arista boycott, which I won't go super into. Instead, I'm gonna focus on this subset issue. In 1980, uh, you have British independent labels, Rough Trade and Beggar's Banquet, signing new wave and post-punk groups, such as Joy Division, which I wore the t-shirt, it's ubiquitous in college radio, uh, the Buzzcocks, uh, and the raincoats. Miles Copeland III, manager for Squeeze and for his brother's band, The Police, launches IRS records for which he crafted an innovative promotional plan. He secured distribution from Jerry Moss, the head of A&M. With this deal, he brought the Buzzcocks to the United States and he relied on college radio. As MBR DJs noted, 
the small new wave label signed many acts broken by the station. WMBR played the Buzzcocks as well as the Cramps, which had released independent singles before signing with IRS. But when IRS instituted a $25 fee for records sent to non-commercial stations, the DJs were baffled. The music director told label reps the station was just not gonna pay this fee. Not only did he balk at the sum, he considered it a betrayal. We feel, he explained, the fee placed an unjustified burden on a station that has supported them. He asked DJs to re refrain from playing new IRS records until the label rescinded the charge. A DJ responded, seems like the IRS is indeed living up to their name. See what I mean? IRS had yet to release its first number one record in 1981, of course, the Go-Go's Beauty and the Beat which would top college radio charts on its way to commercial success and MTV. Peter Buck still worked at Athens Wuxtree Records and had only just met Michael Stipe. Their band, REM, would sign to RIS and define college rock. But in 1980, that success linked to college radio had yet to establish the label's might and the medium's influence. WMBR's DJs believed IRS depended on non-commercial stations, not vice versa. I love this picture of them. They're very, very young. Nonetheless, these stations lacked collective clout. With industry publications such as College Media Journal only having just recently appeared to track college charts in 1978, College radio is still kind of nascent in being able to prove its industry influence. IRS too sought to establish its reputation. If stations had to pay for record service, it would be clear they offered high quality music, right? What you pay for things that are valuable. Copeland wanted the credibility that came with independence and the prestige afforded to major labels. And he thought record fees were the way to do this. For the majors, bands featuring synthesizers or more experimental sounds still seem like a passing fad. IRS strove to legitimate the music and college radio is important to that, but appearing as a major player took precedence. WMBR's famed punk show, The Late Risers Club, began though a month long boycott, months long, with many months of IRS, closing off a primary show on which its artists would appear. While no meaningful larger boycott of IRS emerged, the same was not true for Arista, uh, which most of these comments that I have uh, drawn from a CMJ editorial uh, are, are commenting about. Um, for that record label, a multi-station boycott emerged centered in college stations around the Northeast, spearheaded by the station at Wesleyan University. They're dense and well-connected. It was a good site for that. So the, these college DJs, they relied on a sense of connectivity though with their listeners and believed that their status as music fans as well as promoters of content justified their free record service. But changes were happening in college radio. WMBR had long been a pipeline for DJs headed to commercial radio in addition uh, for musical acts that would define popular music in the coming decades. Also in 1980, Henry Santoro, uh, you can hear him on uh, WGBH, I think, reading the news these days. Uh, Henry Santoro was doing a shift at WMBR. The phone rang, and on the other end of the line came an Irish-accented man's voice. I have this band here, he explained. I'm not going to do the accent. They aren't on tour yet, and their record isn't out, but I'd like to show them a radio station how it works. Can we arrange a visit? Sure, Santoro replied. Why not? About an hour later, a group of four teenagers and their manager, the man on the phone, filed into the windowless station. U2 had yet to release their first album, Boy, which would produce no hit singles, but establish the band's fan base in Ireland, the UK, and on college radio in the United States. Whether this visit coincided with the band's visit to WBCN that year, where DJ Carter Allen another WMBR alum and board member who had moved to WBCN uh, promoted the band, that remains unclear. In March, 1981, the band did appear on many other college radio stations, KFJC in San Jose, California, for one, um, when they played a free show at San Jose State University. A listener there called the band Fresh 
and the band recognized that college radio stations played music that was quote real real rock fans turned to the left of the dial college radio stations even if amateur and non-commercial though confronted questions of listenership and service university administrators grew increasingly interested in how their institution sounded to wider communities while openings for new types of relevance emerged the fcc encouraged college station license holders to ensure stations adhere to regulatory rules and serve the public and not use these higher increasingly higher powered signals as playthings or sandboxes as they were often called djs even those seeking careers in broadcasting though still wanted to play cool music to wield cultural power and much of that remained beneath the radar of commercial radio. The FCC wasn't very cool, but it did influence college radio's emerging culture and its ability to break bands such as U2 to stardom. The FCC could indirectly shape these non-commercial stations despite their educational purpose and institutional homes. We had a diverse landscape of college radio remained populated by many small stations each doing their own thing, maintaining their own islands of influence, even though coordination and attention was beginning to emerge. I'm sorry, this is pulled from the pages of CMJ, so it's a little grainy. <clears throat> but CMJ's debut, which you see an excerpt from here, helps to validate college radio as a decentralized but powerful network with coherent musical influence. But still questions about college radio's direction and its status as gatekeepers and tastemakers remained, even as these conflicts over record service faded. These DJs felt that they had a more authentic connection over music that set them apart from commercial broadcasters. And that sense of being an outlet for the people, a media democracy, simultaneously filtered into debates regarding college radio's role in the commercial music industry. Episode three, there's the block schedule. So by the late 1970s and early 1980s, Harvard and MIT both pursued controversial urban renewal efforts with uncertain results. In 1980, the Buy Dole Act allowed universities to reap financial awards through licensing federally funded research innovation. Rather than having to allow research to be publicly available, institutions shifted to what one historian called an entrepreneurial, financially risky, and philanthropically inclined financial model. This shift came with implications for residents of deindustrializing cities, transforming to the service and information economy. Working class neighborhoods surrounding the most uh, surrounding and suffering uh, from these tr transitions often felt that their voices were unheard in these processes, and that extended to these radio signals. So at WMBR, a debate over community service flared in 1980 in this context, and D as these DJs begin to consider the meaning of college radio itself. City residents were blocking MIT's expansion into East Cambridge as the university pursued collaborations in biotech and alignments with private industry to revitalize the Kenmore Square area. But the radio station reached widely into these communities, unimpeded except by the limits of its signal. Conflict emerged over a new schedule that cut community-oriented programs and increased opportunities for students. A DJ charged that these decisions commenced without a good sense of who the audience was. He argued WMBR needed market research to develop a more concrete idea of who our listeners are to better serve them. So this kind of market-based rhetoric reflects this new logic of universities' community involvement in these urban improvements, often displacing residents who lack resources and power. Yet it also reflected the station's sense of community obligation and its commitment to public service. So audiences put up with a program that underwent wholesale changes. This thing go forward. There we go. The block program. Uh, wholesale changes three times a year as student schedules change. You go from semester to semester, and they still tuned in. But some teachers felt that block programming and these frequent schedule changes sparked a philosophic problem 
As one DJ put it, we lost our commitment to diversity some years ago when we instituted block programming. The structure chopped up time into discrete units rather than creating continuous programs. Blocks allowed DJs to stick to their interests and it siloed listeners when the argument rather than expanding musical coverage or exposing listeners to more than niche sounds. He proposed WMBR staffers rededicate ourselves to, diver to diversity and recommit to presenting shows and ideas not heard elsewhere in Boston radio, even if it means breaking up some of these program blocks. So a movement to remove the program director grew out of this dissatisfaction, motivated by these program changes that went forward without consulting affected DJs. 22 volunteers met with 14 voting no confidence in the program director. They didn't have a quorum, so they couldn't, they didn't have the power of removal. But even if it didn't reflect a quorum, it suggested dissatisfaction with student managers among the community DJs in particular. DJ Dan Gerwitz, a future music writer for the Boston Herald explained, the vote was clearly saying, many of us are sick and tired of the arbitrary power the role of program director wields around here. Each program director might take the station in new directions. DJs had no mechanism to control the power and limits of the job, he said. The general manager appointed the program director. It was not an elected position and therein lay the problem. The system, Gerwitz maintained, was undemocratic and violated the core principles of college radio. Instead, he proposed a year round schedule with major changes subject to state, uh, state, statewide, stationwide, there we go, discussion. He wrote, I am in favor of democracy. If we can't have democracy work in an all volunteer people's radio station, where can it work? If college radio couldn't make it work. The democratic media was not possible. Some doubted participatory democracy could produce a schedule though. When it came to democracy, one DJ wrote, the perfect example is a lynch mob. An oligarchy, an oligarchy and tyranny could easily result from a purportedly democratic system. Another DJ called using democratic practices to shape a program a cute idea, but extremely inefficient. She continued, imagine what would happen if we needed to get consensus on a schedule, we'd be off the air till 1999. But who exactly were the citizens of WMBR? Was it the DJs? MIT students whose facilities housed the studio? Residents of Boston and Cambridge? These dynamics, these questions mirrored uh, urban development proponents and opponents' arguments regarding MIT's expansion. These were private institutions for the most part, occupying and influencing public space. How they answered for their service, however, was complicated and many of those involved felt marginalized. So this debate over programming involved deep questions about the viability of community radio run through institutions like MIT and sustaining democratic media, especially when many of these people saw institutions like MIT more as rivals than allies amid conflicts over urban real estate, both oral and physical. Meanwhile, it's part of the book. Station business continued. A beagle wandered into the studio. A DJ put out a call for its adoption. A DJ reported on development issues, fielding calls from World Bank staffers. Some enterprising volunteers took it upon themselves to reorganize the record library, flushed records that received no airtime. Control knob uh, appeared to be adding audio distortion to a studio device. Uh, there's lots of debates over whether you should put more jolt or coke in the station machine. It's a big deal. But the battle, as one DJ called it, continued. She called the new program schedule method screwed because the same problems reoccurred with each round. A poor management system, she concluded, not poor managers must be the problem. A system developed under a 10 watt mentality did not transfer well to higher wattage that reached a wider range of listeners. But the controversy grew tiring. For what it's worth, she concluded, I'm sick of this shit. Eventually, one of WMBR's most famous DJs weighed in. Oedipus 
the first punk rock radio DJ in the country, by 1980 had moved from WMBR to local commercial rock station WBCN and to WMBR's board. He stated definitively, WMBR is a democracy, it is simple. Station managers elect a general manager who in turn appoints a program director according to the constitution. Vote out the general manager to change things you don't like. A disgruntled DJ resented Oedipus for his comments, responding, listen, slughead, if you put in more time here at the station, especially at station meetings, we'd respect your comments. But the fact of the matter remained, WMBR's DJs came from various walks of life. Some lived in dorms and could readily volunteer or attend events and meetings. Community DJs had day jobs and had trouble popping by the station to organize the record library during their free time. College radio, whether a democracy or not, relied on volunteers to keep things running and functioning. Moreover, rumors circulated that MIT's administration viewed the station with distress. No one mentioned the reasons for this, which is totally possible that this stemmed from DJs publishing recommendations in the student newspaper about which New Wave clubs carded Laxley for beer. But DJs interpreted the rumors as relating to low student involvement and the station's community orientation. The answer was to recruit more students, including grad students who might stick around for a little bit longer. But college radio was a hot property by the mid 1980s, garnering attention for its cutting edge music and phonic aesthetic, setting trends that would redefine pop culture and MTV in the Reagan era. As such, it was not immune from culture war battles over indecency and obscenity, with one station even rising to the attention of Tipper Gore and the PMRC in 1986. So 1980s epilogue. So by the 1980s, we have market, institution, culture warrior, all wanted to control what went out over the collegiate airwaves. At WMBR in 1987, the station revisited tensions between student and community volunteers, revisiting those debates from 1980, but now in an increasingly fraught political and cultural context. The controversy over Four Lovers Only, the program, was not, despite surface appearances though, a culture war between black and white musical forms and audiences nor was it necessarily about the content of music and potential fines that would threaten the station's financial integrity. Instead, the turmoil arose from the multiple demands placed on college stations in the 1980s. As more groups sought coverage from collegiate signals, or at least sought to maintain the airtime that they had already secured amid deregulation, programmers struggled to weigh these demands. They simply had more applicants than they could accommodate. Nonetheless, the effect was to silence certain voices, no matter the intent. So in fall of 1987, there's another, another instance of the block schedule, station managers are planning a new schedule and they gave DJs notice to reapply for their shows. Four Lovers Only was a popular longstanding community run show that highlighted R&B from mostly black artists and it did not receive renewal because it applied late. The producer of Sugar Shack, another R&B program called canceling for lovers only a slap in the face. The station relied on fundraising for operating money. If it's all right to go to the community and ask them for money to modernize this place, he argued, then it should be station policy to serve that community musically. Sugar Shack's producer referenced rising criticism over the ghetto. The ghetto and for lovers only tended to focus on R&B and soul and less on hip hop which is instead covered by shows such as Leko's Lemma, which began in 1985 and aired on both WMBR and WCBC at Boston College. R&B DJs interpreted the cancellation, which proceeded after only two days notice to submit for renewal, as signaling a desire to give students more airtime at the expense of community DJs. Students had made up less than 30% of programming staff during the previous spring semester. But still, students supported the station's community radio identity. One defended Four Lovers Only, denoting that the debate involved questions of what WMBR wants to be and what we students want to do here. 
They could provide community service to MIT and our listeners, um, <clears throat> excuse me, our, and our listeners in the greater Boston area, thanks to whom we're now in stereo as they gave money, or we could jerk off in a vacuum. Donations helped fund that upgrade in broadcast equipment. And thus, the students suggested, programmers owed listeners music they wanted to hear, whether it was MIT students tuning in or not. And if they didn't, he implied, they're missing out on an education. But competing service demands and the practicalities of running a radio station created dissonance. Responding to the charge that cuts targeted black music programming, the music director tried to define diversity as more than giving airtime to black artists. Alternative radio, he explained, isn't just black radio. These shows, he argued, received ample time. Other than progressive rock, he continued, black programming has the most airtime. Most of Sunday, both Thursday and Friday nights are dedicated to black music. If you wanna talk numbers, he said, that's a pretty high percentage. The real reason for the cuts, he explained, were scheduling conflicts. A show run by students took precedence over community volunteers in a contested time slot. He asked that rather than complaining about lack of communication, community DJs attend meetings and read station announcements. Station participation was important, but these requirements potentially undermine the priority of ensuring that programming met community demands. And here's uh, where you can find archived tapes of Leko's Lemma at uh, UMass Boston's Hip Hop Archive. So in the wake of this deliberation, a DJ cited recent regulatory changes. Until the 1980s, the FCC promoted localism and diversity in radio ownership. But rule changes removed limits on multiple station ownership by single entities. As the Reagan administration relaxed antitrust rules, corporate acquisitions accelerated across media industries, led, of course, by none other than Ted Turner, the very mogul who had purchased WMBR's formal call letters to launch his media empire. Public service requirements disappeared as well. Deregulation, the MIT DJ suggested, meant it is no longer necessary for a radio station to demonstrate that it will serve the needs of the community to which it broadcasts, a core commitment of WMBR. What all this boils down to, he continued, is that with more and more restricted, lowest common denominator programming on commercial stations becomes even more important for a handful of non-commercial stations to serve the programming needs of the less entrenched segments of our society. When you're in the archives and you're looking for like the money quote, where like the historical subject says the thing that you think is going on, it's like one of those jump up out of your chair moments, that quote was one of them. R&B shows on WMBR were an institution in the black community, the DJ argued, and he lamented petty station politics. It was a damn shame, it's only two hours. The FCC <laughs> and deregulation increased pressure on college stations during the 1980s, which remained locally grounded to air the voices of underserved communities as commercial radio corporatized. But institutional logics, governance structure, and station mission also sh shaped WMBR's history as it shifted over time, serving as a site for these deep debates about regulation, the business of media and entertainment, and the possibilities for democratic radio. Student and community DJs might square off over whose application took precedent in a certain time slot, but the real politics of college radio were about much more. Instead, the logic regarding structure of programming, the methods of governance and financing, as well as stations occupation of valuable spots on public airwaves, combined to make these signals a key battleground in institutional and cultural change. No one can understand the multifaceted culture wars that continue to rage without understanding the business and politics of these institutions on the front lines. These campus stations were in the crosshairs of government regulators, increasingly diverse sets of affluent Americans and local communities underserved by media 
in an era of austerity that was already causing social services, media outlets, and public spaces to contract. The culture wars are, as Pat Robertson declared, a war for the soul of America. Americans consumed much media about these battles, but communities and college students participated in the culture wars through local media like college radio. So the culture wars revealed by college radio and WMBR involved a, sound, a war for the sound of America and for the viability of democratic media. And I hit my ending target like on the minute. Thank you. <laughs> So I can leave, I have a little selection of WMBR's top 30 from CMJ, and I can talk about my, my data project here. And the, it's very fuzzy, which is, I put up there for a reason. Uh, so should I stop sharing my screen? Okay. Thanks to everyone online for hanging in. Well, thank you so much, uh, Catherine. That was outstanding. Uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, definitely a lot of history I don't know. I've only been on the station for going on four years. But what I do see that some of the people listening, uh, including in the room here, have some longer. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's probably a good idea. All right. So, Catherine, thank you for the talk. Uh, as I was saying, that I've only been on the radio station for about four years, and so it's really fabulous uh, to uh, uh, to hear this history. I mean, it's it's a remarkable story, uh, and uh, the the book is still alive. That's right, although it's taken a little hit during the COVID uh, era. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the book is the first thing you're introduced to, I think, as a new DJ. Um, and what right? What an amazing document, amazing things you found from it. Uh, so I, I just I have one question. I'm, I'm sure there are questions from the audience as well, and I can dive back in with more. Uh, but I'm really interested to hear more about um, these questions of democracy uh, and and sort of the the role this idea of alternative. Uh, so I, I read this article in, in the Boston Magazine, I believe it was, and I forget the author, but it, it made this very striking argument for me about counterculture. Uh, and thinking about sort of the counterculture of the 80s, particularly. And, and, and Boston used to be a hotbed of counterculture and Bob Dylan comes up here and Joan Baez and it was Boston. And, uh, and, and so that there was, there was this sort of idea. And then the, the article goes on to argue that we've lost that. You know, Boston's no longer a center of counterculture. And why is that? And interviewing some of the different folks who, who do organizing in town of what used to be known as counterculture. I'm, I'm thinking of Alston Pudding or, or these different organizers of music events that formerly would have been known as, as counterculture, but now doesn't quite feel the same way. And, and, and the argument, that was made, which I think is kind of interesting, and I don't know what to make of it, and partly because I don't think so historically. Uh, that's why I'm very curious to hear your opinion. But the, 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 the conclusion of the article, as I understood it, is that when you have the internet, and when you have access uh, to all the things, that the, the battles of, of the counterculture, we talked about the counterculture, what, was sort of linked us back in the 80s a little bit uh, was the idea that we were being force fed a, a narrow range of television, a narrow range of radio. I grew up in a rural high school in upstate New York. We didn't have, we, had, we actually did have a couple college stations, uh, but even there you felt like the path, like it was, it was very hard. Uh, and so that with a kind of dominant mainstream media and without the internet where one could somehow access everything, there was the counterculture could sort of fight together, you know. That it was a time when punk and hip hop were very much on the same team in new wave, you know. They say, yeah, they, no, they won't play us on the radio. They don't like us. They they only play the older stuff. Uh, we can't get access, and so there was a way that these disparate things could be lumped together under counterculture. But, but now, when arguably I would say that the media is even more powerful, even more forcing, forcing it down, down our throats, uh, that the impetus that is it the image that, well, I can still access what I want on YouTube, I can still access what I want somewhere else, 
uh, for a while, as I can still download it on Napster. You know, that the, there was a kind of breakdown uh, and, and a, a sort of breaking up of this this group, and and that the the enemy is actually stronger than ever. But but the the idea that we don't need to fight that battle is somehow broken up uh, the possible alliances that are there. And, and I'm wondering what you think of that. You know, is there something to that? I know you've been thinking about, well, what is alternative media? What would, what would make a more democratic media? Um, and, and it is, I, I suppose, maybe that's part of the question too, is the counterculture done forever, you know, <laughs> or, or, or is there something else? Uh, or, or is this not the way to think about it? So I, I don't, there's, there's a few different things mixed in confusedly in there. So if you can make something out of that question. Yeah, I well, I think, here. so the question of aesthetics okay. kind of runs throughout this. And there's this idea that, you know, so something countercultural has a sort of aesthetic juxtaposition, you know, it's, it's different somehow. It's, you know, it's weird music that nobody wants to hear. And like, but you have this sort of community of people who understand something that, you know, most people won't. And so there's that kind of community of belonging around aesthetic. But when you actually dig into terms like alternative and where they come from, so in the 70s, frequently the term alternative comes up probably even more so than progressive when it comes to college and community radio. And But it wasn't an aesthetic definition. It was just we're offering things that the commercial media won't play because it doesn't fit through that the, the model that they have or you know and that's as this commercial radio radio formats we're starting to identify by kind of demographic subset for fragmenting and in that process of fragmentation they're kind of leaving these pieces out that were underserved and so you know the of the 1980s it's you know it sort of starts to develop an aesthetic association with post-punk hip-hop, you know, and, and that they, but it's really, they aren't aligned along an aesthetic counteraction to the mainstream industry, even though it's there, right? That's important. <laughs> it's very important. You know, the green-haired freaks hang out at the radio station. They look different. They sound different. They want to hear different things. The structure of media that they're sort of engaging with through the language of aesthetics is sort of what, what's happening in the counterculture of, of the 1980s. And, you know, and that, that question of access is so present. You know, when I, I interviewed a whole bunch of um, musicians and they were talking about, you know, how they would, um, they'd read about a band in a zine, for example, you know, like their friend would give them a zine and, I, and you know, after chemistry class or something like, did you read about this? Oh, I want to hear what that's like. All right, let's drive out into the country where we can sort of pick up this college radio station and we'll call and we'll request it. Like maybe we'll catch it and then, you know, bring a radio and we can record it. And then we'll then I'll have, it, have it on a tape. And then I can decide if when my parents take me to the, to the city next month, I can find an independent record store and maybe I'll go get a copy or I can write in, you know, to Discord records or whatever and they'll send me a copy of it. That, that, that access question was really powerful. And I think it's so, you know, when I could queue up any of those records right now on my phone, those barriers have come down. But instead, but I think the, the thing that connects across all of those that unites sort of countercultural idea is the question of gatekeepers and tastemakers. And I think one of the challenges that I've run into is that a lot of people who are participating in this, they, this alternative ecosystem or these scenes or these bohemian networks or whatever, they're trying to create alternative markets, but they want different systems of distribution and remuneration for artists. And they're relying on different, you know, literally different businesses and informational networks than the commercial music industry. So there is that kind of oppositional it, it does sort of there is this moment where they are viable and artists can make a living you know or at least get by through this alternative market structure um, but they are erecting sort of a new system of tastemakers and and gatekeepers in within that alternative system that I think a lot of times in the language that you see people talking about the counterculture, they sort of resist that idea, right? It is that sort of democratic, like 
we're letting everybody in, but you know, sort of the meritocratic part of that does creep in. Um, and so, and that can end up being sort of a wedge among those different groups, you know? So a lot of times, one of the things I run into is that you have at a college radio station, mostly white station managers. And I say, we, we love rap and hip hop. You know, we're mixing public enemy into the rotation, but we're not including black students as part of station management to actually like rethink the structure of programming and sort of who gets to control how those access, the, the airways are sort of set up. Um, just that they're, they're not thinking, you know, they're, they're thinking through their own sort of lens. And so I guess now that we have everything, you know, I talked to a KEXP DJ and they look at themselves more as curators. That was the term that they used rather than gatekeepers and tastemakers because there's so much stuff out there, but we still need a way to kind of find our, find the things that we like, find our aesthetics within that. Um, and so I think, you know, the, we won't go into the is college radio dead question yet, maybe, but it's, that's kind of part and parcel of that, that bigger question. Great. All right, good. I, I'm sure there are other questions, comments. Uh, we can start in the room and then uh, please people online. Uh, we would like to have uh, more discussion as well. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering there should be your hey, could you introduce yourself to us? Oh, hi, my name is Amber and I'm a second year student at CSA. Thank you so much for, <laughs> for your interview. Uh, so I was really interested in your like images and those I assume are your sources. Mm -hmm. So I would want you to talk a little bit more about like your research methodology and how did you choose your sources? There's there were so varied sources. So yeah. Yeah. So for in one sense, the MIT book is really unique. I think I even put that in the slide in college radio history because it gives me longitudinal access to one station in a kind of coherent format over time. It's like finding the world's longest email thread. Um, but it's so it is unique of any station that I've been to that has that kind of source. Um, I'll find, you know, there'll be, you know, they call them jock books in some other stations or something like that. Um, you also find, you know, one from like a year or a couple years. And they're always like these really, really vibrant pictures of the conversations that are happening in the station. Um, and so on the one hand, so on the one hand, the WMBR source like really stands out and is really unique. And that's what makes it a great station for me to, put together a talk like this because I can get that, that picture. For the most part though, the research is really fragmented because I'm relying on college students <laughs> to put stuff in a box and send it to an archive um, or to you know not throw away stuff or like not spill their jolt soda all over program logs or something like that. So it can, it can be very disjointed. Um, a lot of my uh, good quotes also come from student newspapers, uh, which thankfully a lot of them have been digitized, which made the research really uh, easy to do in, for, you know, I was able to get lots of stuff and, you know, call letters are pretty easy to search for. So, so that kind of eased the process for a lot of that. Um, but, you know, in, in the book and they would put in things like they would take a clip, like if they're covered in the Boston Globe or something, they paste the clip in the book and then everybody would like mark it up. Um, at WUOG at UGA, there was a big fight over their format and they, the administration instituted a manager that they all hated and somebody like took his picture and they were like pig like over his picture. So, you know, you get this really like, I don't know why I'm using this word, organic kind of picture of this, of this kind of like in the studio on the ground. Um, but when it comes to trying to put together a whole narrative of when you're trying to tell the national history of college radio, it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle because I only have a couple of stations like WMBR, which is not gonna touch on every single issue anyways. Were, so I really wanted to have like a cast of characters to tell the history of college radio through, you know, like 10 stations or something, but instead I have like 60 because I have to like piece together this, and the, the book is way too long. So if you ended up with 60 stations, how did you end up organizing the book and figuring out what your through line 
Yeah, my initial thoughts uh, ended up not panning out. You know, I thought I would be like really methodical, method, methodical. There we go. You know, like I would have a few like major market stations and like public universities and private universities and then small liberal arts colleges. And, and it ended up like I was just sort of like, you know, wide arm grab and put it in the blender and like kind of see what came out. Um, you know, I, I wish I could say that I stuck to like some sort of method throughout, but instead it, I kind of, basically I had these little chunks of stories. I would just like kind of write up these episodes. Like I put the talk together today. I, like, I have this episode, I'm like, I'm just gonna write it up for my sources. And, you know, I used things the program scrivener, you know, how you can like kind of chop, chop it up into these little pieces on a cork board. And so I just kind of like gather them and be like, these two, these two stories kind of go together, like what's going on there? And then I would kind of go back into the context and sort of uncover like, oh, it really has to do with this kind of regulatory shift. And so it's, it moves chronologically and thematically at the same time. So there's 18 total chapters right now. Let's see, we'll see what happens in the final final version of it, but you know, so the first part, which a lot of this, um, the first episode, the uh, um, the ghetto's debut is actually in the first book that's sort of been chopped off. Um, so that's not actually in this book, but the other two episodes are, um, and the four lovers only probably not gonna be in there because it's similar to the 1980 debate. Um, but it is this, that kind of like fluid process of like moving across different examples. And so I try to have some geographic diversity within each and different types of institutions. Um, but this, the distinctions between, I thought there would be huge differences between like public and private universities. And it's almost, almost no difference. It's so such a diverse landscape and radio markets really play a big role in what the stations look like. So it's, it's really hard to distinguish between um, public and private institutions. That's very interesting. I think we have a lot of questions in the uh, uh, maybe, I don't know if they're in the chat room or in the Q&A area, but see things pop up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I saw someone ask a question. Uh, there is a question from the chat here uh, from uh, Deborah Douglas. Thank you for this question. Uh, oh, that's right. Everybody okay, knows. thank you. Here we go. Uh, I'll try again. So Deborah Douglas okay, asked a question go. and just uh, came to the host of the panelists, so, so everybody Deborah can't Douglas see it. I will read it out. Uh, the there are a class of, quote, college stations out. that have morphed uh, into NPR stations, such as WBUR, WXPN. How do these fit into your story? Thank you, Deborah. How do these fit into your story? Thank you, Deborah. So NPR is sort of the bad guy. <laughs> my story. Um, I mean, like you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I say this not because my former station was basically sold to NPR, um, but it's it's always sort of this like giant in the room at, for college administrators. So a lot of the college DJs don't aren't necessarily aware of some of the things that are going on, um, but some of the hottest fights in the book like picket lines and like you know screaming like you get duct tape over faces like the whole thing um have to do when administrators try to force stations to adopt npr programming and this, there's a sort of there's a few sort of waves of this there's one in the late 70s and there's one in in the late 80s um but the really the key moment is and i referenced it a little bit in this talk was is with this class d decision because basically the National Association of Educational Broadcasters, which is, are behind a lot of big NPR um, signals, you know, which are municipally owned, like WBEZ in Chicago is municipally owned, WNYC, um, and then the WBURs, um, they and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting were pushing to create this national network and they relied on high wattage clear channel signals. And so what would happen is you would have a 90.9 launch, increase the wattage to 50,000 watts or whatever. And then out there in the hinterlands, it, we would hit this little 10 watt station. And so it would impede the coverage of these signals. So they're the ones who are push, pressuring the FCC to do away with those 10 watt licenses. Um, but there is a sort of ironic effect because they're basically saying you have to upgrade to 100 watts or more and you know 
spend a lot of money and to become a more sort of full service station to survive. If otherwise your signals are just gonna get obliterated. And what ends up happening is a lot of stations upgrade. And so that you know, increases this visibility on college stations at this moment where they're also playing all this weird independent label music stuff and reaching kids in the suburbs. And so it has a sort of ironic effect of sort of amplifying sort of bohemian sound on, on, the, on the radio. Um, but NPR, it's always there. And I've had to kind of break off some of the NPR stuff because there's a whole story to tell there over sort of the battles of, over whether these signals would become NPR stations. Um, so instead I've chosen to sort of focus on what's going on mostly in the studios rather than kind of in these administrative conversations, but they're definitely there uh, and they definitely make a lot of people mad. I, I'd like to hear about the relationship between the universities and colleges and their stations, their stations, <laughs> and the kind of power dynamics and issues that the stations have in relationship to like the administration one sort of assumes that it's constantly hostile and so on because, you know, the, the, the kids are playing and the music the administration doesn't like or they're acting out or whatever. Like that's kind of the default assumption that we make. But I imagine it's, it's much more complicated. I'm wondering if there's scenarios where the administration is like, we're just going to take over so that we can do our line on the show instead. Or, you know, would you get at some of just the beyond the like good guy, bad guy narrative that one kind of assumes this and play and, and tell us more about how things tend to work out. Yeah, it really is all over the map. You know, sometimes you have um, students who are pushing for these signals to be more mainstream or to provide more professional training. They're saying, you know, I came here to college to get a job and, you know, this becomes an increasing narrative over time. You know, so I want professional experience. I want it to be like working at a commercial station where I can then go out into the field and get a job and prove, you know, that I have sales experience or, or whatever. Um, WPRS is the perfect example. Yes, WPRS. It's because they're trying to be what they think is professional, but it's really like amateurish uh, commercial. Stuff. Yeah, and like a lot of it are stations with a broadcasting program or a journalism program. Sometimes it's the faculty. Um, I have a whole chapter on the University of Kansas where uh, Steve Ducey of Fox News is an alum of their radio show, radio uh, station from the 1970s. Um, you know, so like really professional, like journalists, you know, students, you know, prestigious journalism program. Um, but then, you know, Lawrence has this whole, whole like crazy music scene and Williams Burroughs is hanging around and like, it's like super, you know, avant-garde, which is great venues. And, this touring circuit and so the station starts you know to go progressive but then the faculty in the 80s start to say like oh whoa like let's bring the station in and like, there's, there's a big fight and you know there's a, another picketing thing and an fcc fine and you know drama ensues so in that case it's the faculty supported by a dean um, but then in other situations you have you know the administration wanting to sort of prove that it has you know, sort of this public service mindedness. And so they look to their radio station. And that's where you get a lot of the push for NPR programming or professionalization. I have a whole tag in Zotero of like administrative takeovers. A lot of times what they would do is they would sort of handpick a student or a graduate student to come in as a station manager to kind of clean things up. Um, and there would be particular moments where this, this happened. Usually, uh, so a big moment is around 1980 when stations are upgrading their signals, uh, when they start to go progressive and play more new wave. Um, then there's another round of them in the 1990s where you have station closures. Um, the, probably the most outrageous example of an administration kind of going off the rails and, and closing a station happens at Adelphi University on Long Island, uh, which if you know the lore is where Chuck D and uh, Public Enemy formed in the early 1980s that, you know, they were all college radio DJs there. T Chuck D talked about it as um, the place where he found his voice. And what ends up happening is these, these narratives over these college stations really replicate these larger higher education battles that we see over the value of liberal arts. So you have on the one hand, you know, are these stations laboratories for stations for students to get professional experience so that they can go out and be you know, 
positive members of the workforce? Or are they these places where students engage in sort of liberal arts inquiry as a student activity can kind of go out and find their voice, like Chucky said, and discover new music and expand cultural horizons and create new culture. And, and so you see those, the same kinds of array of sides in that larger debate over curricula visit on these stations. So in the, in the 90s, um, a president there at Adelphi comes in and he has this sort of culture wars, you know, Western civilization, I'm gonna defend the canon. And what is this radio station that's connected to these community members and oh, they're black and they listen to hip hop. And I don't think that sounds like college. So I'm gonna get rid of the station. And he, he shuts it down over uh, over about a year and, and it's gone. It, WBAU no longer exists. And it was this major uh, force sort of in popularizing uh, hip hop, in, particularly into, into the suburbs in the 1980s. Run DMC hung out there all the time. And um, Dr. Dre of UMTV Raps was an alum and- um, Yeah, no problem. But, yeah, the- uh, the heiress to boycott gets basically its own chapter because again, it kind of comes at that crucial moment when you have the class D decision taking place, economic woes hitting the record industry and all of a sudden all of the majors are instituting the service. And, and so it's really, so it's Wesleyan is the, the key kind of at the center of that. And there's a sort of like reluctant music director who's like, well, I guess I'm gonna take this on. Uh, and and you know, lead the charge and it gets tons and tons of press and attention. And, you know, it is sort of interesting that it's like focused on this one station, I mean, this one record label when there were other cuts happening. Um, but I think it was because of that sort of unique relationship that Arista had with college stations and the music that it was offering, right. um, that it was sort of kind of a prime, a prime target for that. Um, but I have to say it's definitely one of my favorite chapters in the whole thing. Uh, lots of good quotes. Um, but yeah, so Larry let me into the studio and I sat on this little wooden chair. I was pregnant with my third child while I was doing this over the course of like four months. And so after a while, like I couldn't fit the book on my lap anymore. <laughs> I had to like readjust. It's like all of a sudden all my photos change angle and various things. So it's, it's very like kind of visceral experience of Saturday mornings and usually back backwoods was on, I think, while I was there. So I got to Excellent. enjoy backwoods. Well, you briefly mentioned <laughs> the end of the fairness doctrine. How or <laughs> did such a decision impact college physics? Yes, I, I put that in for Heather. <laughs> it really it really didn't affect college stations, except there were a few talk shows that were on college radio. And so but a lot of times the conversation in those individual shows didn't really end up in the records that I was looking at. Um, there were a couple of, kind of outrageous moments, though, with those talk shows. Uh, for some reason, in the late 1980s, um, a bunch of college students, I have at least three instances that I found, um, decided that it would be a great idea to debate Ku Klux Klan members on the air. Um, because, you know, like David Duke was sort of like rising, there's sort of resurgent KKK. And so they're like, well, we're going to like do our service to public debate and put these people on the air and defeat them and show everybody how wrong they are. Like a really bad, really bad idea. And, you know, there was uh, lots of pushback, unsurprisingly, because of this. Um, and, you know, but they sort of use that kind of like fairness doctrine model for like how they were thinking about it, I think, or that was at least because that was sort of in the news. I think that was also part of their thinking in the way that they were shaping those debates. Um, but what's really interesting, so one of the examples actually comes from my alma mater station at Vanderbilt. You know, these two students are sort of like, it's like they're taking like a conversation that happens in a classroom where they're sort of trying out ideas and like cloning it on the air. Uh, I think that was sort of what they were, what they were thinking about. Um, but they do this and they get like a, basically a slap on the wrist. Like, you know, WRVU, this is a terrible idea. But then about a year later, um, there's a show uh, called 91 uh, Rap, started as 91 Soul, becomes 91 Rap or spawns off 91 Rap. They have this really popular hip hop show. This is like 1989, 1990. 
Um, 91 Rap is on the air. They're having, you know, a few people come by the station. There's sort of some partying going on. At a certain point, some high schoolers get on the mic and, you know, then like there's some kind of conflict. And, you know, I think maybe an obscenity went out over the airwaves. Um, stations shut down for three months. Wow. So the administration kind of like flies in, is like, what's happening in the station? So it's like, okay. So the station a year before put literally KKK members on the air and it was like, and now you have members of the local black community associated with rap and hip hop, you know, basically a, a, a minor incident happens. I mean, I don't know, the, there's not a whole lot of records about what actually happened or what went out over the air, but there were no complaints or there may be a few complaints, but their FCC license was never in jeopardy at all. Um, so there's this kind of disconnect in the way, going back to Heather's question about administrations and the way that they sort of handle content uh, uh, and what these students are doing and kind of the political content. Yeah, this is kind of an incoherent thought, but you know, bringing up the fairness doctrine in relationship to college radio makes me think about the sort of notion that fairness doctrine is, is dealing with you know, political speech and then the other kind of place it's regulated is indecency, and that's just using dirty words and so on, right? That is dirty words, right? Um, but if college radio is, you know, often playing really politically radical music, like you could imagine a, a college radio station constantly playing, say, anti-Nixon type songs or anti-Vietnam songs or anti-Reagan songs still relevant because he doesn't get rid of the fairness doctrine until like 1986. So six years of constant anti-Reagan you know, punk rock or whatever, right? And that's never going to be pointed to as it's unfair speech because it's, it's entertainment and it's not going to be seen as content in the way that a talk show, if they were constantly doing talk shows that were anti-Reagan, they might be subject to fair doctrine in place. So I'm just wondering if you see any, you know, in moments where the music is taken seriously as political speech in terms of how the administrations look at it. Obviously the, the people playing the music understand it as political speech in some way, but just sort of how that played out, maybe one story even mm -hmm. how that played out. Yeah, they definitely see, you know, that's the whole like left of the dial identity and that there's a sort of like progressive political identity that comes sort of with the cultural part of college radio as well as the political associations that it might have. Um, you know, there, I mean, and the, the station that does get in trouble with the PMRC is, um, the UC Santa Barbara station and they don't get fined, but they get sort of reprimanded along with Howard Stern and, uh, KBFK, the Pacifica station. Mm -hmm. And so there is, and particularly in the 1970s, uh, you know, there's a lot of times, um, station managers who come from Pacifica and are sort of creating those sort of ties. Uh, Georgetown station for one, um, it gets sold because they're airing anti-abortion, I mean, abortion um, uh, services, you know, Planned Parenthood clinics, uh, PSAs on their station. So a lot of times where you get that political conversations is, you know, not with talk shows, but with kind of the activist orientation of some of the programs right. um, or the, the associations that they have. Um, WRVU for one had a show that ran throughout the 1990s into the 2000s by DJ Ron, who's a lovely person, um, called Out of the Closet on the Buckle of the Bible Belt, you know, in, in the 90s. And it was you know, pretty controversial that he was, he was doing that. And he got a lot of pushback kind of on campus from that. Um, there were a lot of stations were very supportive of anti-apartheid protests, which is sort of an often overlooked aspect of student protests in the 1980s that like, it was sort of like apathetic student, right. you know, idea, like after the counterculture, uh, totally not true, total myth. Um, and that, that sort of one area. Um, but instead where it comes out really on campus and where you see the most pushback, or right, something in my eye, uh, is they critique it through aesthetics. They're saying like, this is like crappy music that nobody wants to listen to. And, you know, what are you doing with my student fees? Like, I want to hear, you know, stuff that, uh, that I like. And so a lot of the, the sort of content di discussions get sort of filtered through fee structures and governance and sort of these institutional arrangements and institutional politics, which is why the governance structure of these stations, even though it's like, you know, it's not as much fun as like talking about like, you know, black flag lyrics or something, but it's, it's, that's really where the rubber meets the road mm -hmm. is over these sort of, you know, 
bread and butter issues of funding and bylaws and constitutional arrangements. Thank you. I, I just like to say thank you. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, it was a fabulous talk. I, I learned so much about this radio station that, that it seems very humble in the basement <laughs> of a problematic building uh, across the street here. And uh, uh, it's just absolutely fascinating to hear. Uh, this book project sounds fabulous. Is there a, a, a timeline when we might think about the book? It's it is the on the verge of going out for peer review. Okay. It is a complete manuscript. Uh, it is there. I'm, I'm in the cutting of words process. And like I said, there is a second book that I, I had to chop off from the beginning, which is sort of the 60s and 70s counterculture years and sort of free speech on campus uh -huh. uh, kind of lens of st on student media. Um, but hopefully within a year, we will be having book talk type Hooray. conversations. Hooray. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Kevin. I'm just going to close out with a plug for next week. We'll Good idea. Our talk will be 100% virtual next week on Zoom. Uh, and it's going to be with Raquel Gates, who's a professor from Columbia University. And she's going to present her experience working as a consulting producer on the Criterion release of the Melvin Van Peebles Essential Films collection. So that's going to be really, really uh, interesting, really important stuff that she did there. So I'll just end with that. And again, thank you so much. One final round of thank you. And thank you everyone online for coming. Thank you for all of our online. See you next week. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs>